Okay, our next guest, we will, we will stick with the topic for a little longer with the, the human-centered robotics and the interaction between robots and humans. And we do have, um, yeah, I think one of the, the best well-known experts here on stage and actually, um, oh wonder, he's um, living here in Hanover. Normally we need to fly people in from very far places. This time we have someone from Hanover here. Um, and it's Professor Sami um, Haddadin, and he's not only the CEO of KB, um, but also um, a scientist working a lot on uh, robot and human interaction. And he will um, guide us through human-centered robotics, engineering the age of humans and robots. Welcome on stage, Sami. Give him a warm hand, come on. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Normally, I, I, not because I had to interact, I tried, I wanted to interact with Pepper, which right, as right. you could see, it didn't work that well. Normally, I ask my guests um, to, to tell me a dirty secret that I can reveal here on stage. So we, we're going to do that now. Yeah, well, I'm going to show them. I'm going to show them. You're going to show them? You're gonna show them? Yeah, I have okay. many dirty secrets and I'm going to show them. Very good. So we, we wouldn't reveal them right now, but uh, I give you half an hour Great. to reveal all your dirty secrets about robots. Wonderful. I will try my this best. This stage is yours. Thanks so much. All right, so entering the age of humans and robots. I will give or take you on a ride to a new era. Um, we are entering the age of robotics, <clears throat> and this is taking place everywhere around the globe. And I will try to give you an impression of what it actually means and what is there to come. And um, as already introduced, I'm not only a researcher, so I've been working a lot on robots interacting with humans, right? So my robots actually can shake hands. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm also the CEO of KB, which is a very secretive uh, startup, uh, which is actually located in Munich. And um, there's going to be some, uh, something in the end that I, I want to announce. And I really hope that uh, I can draw so much interest that you can actually stay till the end. Right. Okay, so before I will start about robotics, let me start the clock. Just one thing. Excuse me. Let me start my own clock. Okay. So, um, while I'm starting the clock, or not, so I will not take the time of the others, um, I want to give you a kind of impression of what robotics is actually affecting at the moment. So we've got tremendous major global trends, such as autonomous logistics, We've got the trend towards smart cities coming more and more closer. We have the trends of autonomous cars. And why am I saying these things? Why do I bring this into the era of robotics? Um, because all these trends that are kind of also a topic at CBIT and will be especially at Hannover Messe in a, in, in a couple of weeks and are kind of um, all over the places in the media, it's really that everything we talk about in all these smart connected uh, mechatronic systems is really about robotics. And one of the most important ones actually transforming at the moment manufacturing as we know it today is the concept of Industry 4.0, meaning essentially that we get connected automation systems that can learn from each other, that can talk to each other, and that can interact with human beings and basically make it possible to connect the technologies of the digital era and the automation era into a new era of robotics, of connected machines that will be able to automate uh, things that you have not seen before. And I will try to give you a kind of overview of where these things come, what has been uh, done in research, and what is it that actually affects our everyday life. And I just want to give you a kind of brief overview of why do I say that robotics is one of the main driving factors behind all these mega trends we have nowadays all over the globe? So, all the mechatronics that has been the first phase of, of robotics, so building the body of a robot, right? This has been a tremendous effort over the last 20, 30 years, evolving from machines that are just positioning in space to actually interacting physically with the world. So, essentially becoming more and more human-like. Um, then the autonomy problem, coming into navigation. How do I find my way from here to the entrance of the CBIT? How can I actually uh, build maps? How can I navigate autonomously in unknown or possibly unknown and dynamic environments? And coming more and more closer to distributed communication and computing, where we essentially connect systems, let them interact with each other, share knowledge, and get smarter by basically making use of more than the, the single components themselves. So the sum of things is much more than uh, simply the sum. 
And all these drivers, or all these uh, questions have been driven by robotics tremendously and have led to very, very interesting systems as the ones we just saw before and many others in the world. And we are really entering a new age of robotics that is also reflected by the fact that the numbers of robots sold just in industrial robotics, right? Just the classical things we all know from the automobile manufacturers really go through the roof at the moment. And all the big OEMs we all know about that they entered robotics has tremendously driven the awareness of robotics, right? So it's everybody is uh, thinking about, are these robots coming now? Where are we now? Is this really now happening? And I try to give you essentially a view on things and the answer that I would uh, give you is really yes. We are at the era or at the step change, essentially bringing robotics from the past, classical automation, to a new era of robotics that will transform automation and that will essentially then also go into our homes and transform our entire society. So there are very uh, interesting success stories in robotics which already have changed logistics, for example, which we see here. The Kiva Systems example, 1,000 robots warehouse, where we essentially have systems interacting with each other, thousands of robots that basically can um, move around in space. Not there. Not there. Okay. So basically the idea about all these robots is that they can communicate with each other and basically automate the entire logistics tool chain where we kind of have multiple robots taking orders from somewhere around the globe and essentially then um, communicating with each other to automatically bring the good to the place where you are and then basically assemble the box. On the right side, we see a tremendous success in uh, surgical robotics, the Da Vinci system from Intuitive Surgical, which has essentially transformed in, uh, medicine, or surgery to be specific, uh, into a new era where we basically can use minimally invasive surgical operations to have doctors being remotely located from the patient and basically operating via very small trocar points and therefore revolutionizing medicine. Another big story that has been there over the last decade is the iRobot uh, machines that we all or many of us know from our homes nowadays. So we have systems that can actually clean up or help us clean up uh, parts of our home, something that I would really love to have many of them in my home. And this has been ma major driving factors in the mechatronics, in the autonomy part of things. And what comes now? So we just saw a robot that is capable of social interaction, right? But what does it make us successful to essentially interact with the world? What do you do all the time while you are acting, while you exist? So the human's sole existence is based on what we call physical interaction, right? So interaction as we know it nowadays, man-machine interaction, is really governed by non-physical interaction, the human telling the machine certain commands and receiving visual or auditive feedback. However, what is currently happening is really that together with all kinds of VR and haptic interfaces that are kind of supplementary um, technological uh, devices and with all the big things that are going on in bringing high fidelity feedback devices into commercial operation which have cost thousands and, and ten thousands of dollars over the last years and now coming to consumer and, and end customers into prices that we can actually use in our everyday world, we are also finally entering the, the phase of physical interaction. Meaning robots can physically interact with their world and essentially experience it similar to humans. All of you currently physically interact with the world, either through your feet, sitting on a chair, or just holding your hands like that, right? So this is something that makes us as intelligent, as, as capable as we are nowadays. And this is where robotics is now really taking off. So we have machines that can physically interact with humans and therefore exchange information, modify the world, manipulation, right? So we can manipulate the world and we have to do it safely. That's one of the major uh, requirements we have there. And on the interaction side, we can roughly discriminate between what we call cognitive interaction and especially the physical interaction, which is now really transforming automation as we knew it uh, up to now. And I'm going to give you a kind of overview. What is it that has changed, right? What, the, what technologies, which technologies really make this, um, these things possible? And um, if you look at how these systems can now... I'm really sorry, but these videos don't work, right? Just give me a sec.
Ja, die Videos laufen nicht. Nee, da passt nichts. I'm sorry, but robotics without videos is really not that exciting, right? So maybe I'm talking while uh, our technician is really trying to, to solve my problem here. So what we see there is our very famous Chancellor Angela Merkel interacting for the first time with one of these first robots that can physically interact. So she's actually shaking hands with these devices and really um, basically having an intuitive interaction between man and machine and making it possible to really shake hands with politicians, obviously something very important in research, right? So for actually showcasing how this technology can... No, that's not a video. Hmm? There is a video? Ah, now we can see it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great. That's some capabilities. Okay, here you can see really how can robots interact physically with the world, especially with very famous... Um, politicians and decision makers which actually understand that robotics is really taking off. And this is the origins of what we have been seeing over the years. The 80s have been actually the origin of what we call force sensing, what we, what we call f interaction, physical interaction. So robots that can react to dynamical environments, that can feel forces in principle. So all this research has been there for more than 30 years and now we're taking off. So all the big challenges have been tackled and 10 years ago we showed in a very famous European project, this is what we want to achieve. We want to have intelligent devices, robots as smart co-workers that support humans, that relieve them from laborious work and really make them even more capable. Human-robot collaboration is the essence. So how can humans and robots coexist, collaborate and in particular in a safe and intuitive way? So we're basically tearing down walls, barriers between robots and humans, moving away from industrial robotics behind cages, just moving in position control tasks, moving in geometric spaces, but actually taking robots to the human environment and making them capable of physical interaction, right? And this is essentially what all boils down to an Asimov's first law, making robots safe and making this also possible in the real world, not only in research labs, right? And this is actually what we are seeing more and more. Robots and humans collaborating with each other, really helping each other, and the robot is a smart tool that can assist humans, and this is the first step towards taking robots that can really assist us also in the real world in all our homes. More and more industrial manufacturers of robotics or robotics manufacturers in general have contributed to that. So based on the pioneering research many of us have been doing over the last 20 years, more and more systems ranging from Universal Robot, from KUKA, ABB, Rethink Robotics, FANUC and so on and so forth, more of these systems capable of interaction are entering the market and transforming manufacturing. And even the big OEMs now understand that robotics doesn't have to be a fear. They can actually relieve us from laborious work. They can support us. They can make it more flexible also in Europe, also in the US, also in Japan to get back manufacturing, to really understand that humans and robot teams is a fundamentally transforming technology to really bring automation to the next era of uh, automation. And what has made this possible? It's a single distinct technology. It's the sense of touch. So what we essentially did in research, and I'm myself also a researcher, is really enabling machines that classically are just very rigid, humongously large lions in some sense, right? Very strong machines and equip them with a sense of touch, making them able to feel contact forces and make sense of that, right? So what you all are born with and learn while you grow up is something that we embedded into robots and what we call that is torque sensing. So essentially we take the Golgi tendon organ, which all of you have, right? You just stretch your finger, you feel the forces in your joints, you feel there's something going on. And this is what we call proprioceptive sensing. And we basically mimicked that concept bionically and embedded this into highly integrated robots such as the one you see on the right side that essentially is now equipped with a sense of touch. And now what you can do is make use of that. Uh, yeah. So now you can make machines essentially feel and behave as compliantly as humans. You take them by the hand, you just show them something. This is a robot we developed several years ago and that was recently commercialized by KUKA, uh, one of the largest uh, manufacturers in robotics, and really make the system so compliant and so intuitive that they behave instead of 14 kilograms of weight, just as 200 gram, basically free-floating mass in space that you can really um, interact with very then the other thing is, 
being compliant. So the core contraction you have in your muscles, right? Being stiff for certain things, being compliant for other things, is something we can mimic. We basically transform all the concepts from humans for being successful in the physical world into technical. Another thing is, if you want to really be able to do certain manufacturing tasks, and obviously you need to be able to sense forces, you need to be able to accurately regulate them and really do this such as humans. So basically, blind robotics that are able to follow entirely unknown surfaces, right? You basically closing your eyes and just follow a surface that is unknown to you and really make it possible to essentially feel the environment without needing to know the environment. And this makes it possible for the first time to transform automation from what we call rigid automation positioning tasks into assembly. And assembly is to a large extent not automated till today. All of the big manufacturers of cars, for example, what they do automate is really the positioning, right? Painting, drawing and so on. But what really has to be transformed now is assembly. This is something where we need the sense of touch and we need to be able to physically interact with the world. Then, safety. We want to build robots that are safe for collaboration, that are safe for humans. And this needs to make it possible to show reflexes, right? Like humans do. You touch a hot plate, you retract automatically. And this is essentially what we built into these systems, make them capable of detecting contacts within one tenth, ten thousandth of a second, right? They are a thousand times faster in computation than humans and really make this possible to make these systems super safe, even if you equip them with possibly dangerous tools, right? We want to have service robots that cut things for us, and this uh, is some images, so these are my dark secrets, right? So I did all these experiments when I was still a PhD student, and um, enabling these systems of safe interaction, really feeling contact so sensitively and so fast that you can even have sharp tools detecting contacts within one millisecond. Right? This is 60 times faster than the human retraction loop in built in on our bodies. And this can be transformed not only to medical robotics, but even to humanoid systems. Right? We can make humanoid systems capable of interaction, really make them safer for interaction. This is, by the way, the, the Google humanoid you see there that was uh, originally developed by Boston Dynamics. And we could show that we even can make these systems capable of interaction. And not only robots as we all think of, but even drones. Right? Drones is a robotics technology. We could even make flying systems capable of interaction, as you see here, a robot, a drone that is not able to interact, and then systems that can just, like a fly that flies against a glass, right, uh, against the window, detecting the contact and then retracting from it, similar to biological systems. So now we can make f even flying systems capable of interaction. And this is really basically giving you a new sense of, it's like you were blind and now you can see. You couldn't feel, now you can feel. It's really a transforming technology, enabling uh, our society to really build systems and robots that now can learn interaction. So we need to discriminate between interaction, collision with the environment. We need to understand how, is this a collision? Or did I just grasp something? Did I want to manipulate? Or did I want to shake hands? And we essentially now go to the era of transforming mechatronics together with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and so on, into fundamentally new systems that are even able to discriminate between wanted interaction and unwanted interaction, right? Was this something, did you want to grasp the robot, take him by the hand, show him something, or was he just moving against you and essentially understanding that this is a desired interaction with the hand, right? So you just want to grasp the robot. And then if he moves against your body, then this is obviously something that you don't want to. And this robot here automatically learned this type of interaction. So there's no one programming the system and he understands that was a bad collision. There's something going on, that's something wrong, right? And this sense of safety is really something that we can build into these systems. However, there's still one fundamental uh, question. Now that we have all these capabilities, is this robot safe? And several years ago, uh, our former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder had an interaction with one of the systems we developed back then. And back then, to be honest, the systems were not capable of all these interaction and reflexes and so on. And he was a very good uh, soccer player, football player here in Europe, right? And uh, therefore, he still had good reflexes, right? Automatically retracting from the potential collision. And what we then asked ourselves is, if you put robots into human spaces, collaborating with workers, for example, is this safe? Yes or no? The, the robot is equipped with a possibly dangerous tool. And how can we analyze that? By doing crash testing, by understanding, is this dangerous? Yes or no? 
by putting yourself into danger. Or maybe not, right? So really proving these systems can be made safe for interaction. And this has been a game changer in robotics. Basically driving over the last 10 years that we are now there where big OEMs, big manufacturers can actually make use of these systems and really understand how to make them to a certain extent safe for human and robot collaboration. One of the important questions is there, how do you embed this kind of idea of safety into a robot? How can you make him understand that something is safe or not? And we found a solution to essentially make any robot safe by basically understanding from experience what do all these things have in common? What is it that could potentially harm a human being? And then implement into the central nervous system of the robot a kind of strategy that automatically adapts if a human is coming close. So what you see here is basically an industrial task where the robot is moving pretty quickly, right? So he's really doing something useful, he's screwing, and now you see how fast he's moving, right? That's almost maximum speed of the system. And now as soon as the human comes into the game, the robot automatically understands that and then drives only that slow that he still performs the task, but if an unwanted collision that he didn't foresee happens, nothing could happen to the human being. No injury is, pot is potentially there. And if you have all these things together, then something we did a couple of years ago was the first continuously controlled hand-arm system by neural interfaces. So in this experiment that went all over the media, we could show that you can control just via your thoughts an entire robot system as it was your arm. And we could only do this experiment because the system is capable of interaction, because it's safe, and because it can understand contacts, right? And this is the only reason why these things were possible for the first time. So what you could see there is a lady that couldn't interact with the world for 20 years, and the robot, capable of interaction, gives her that sense back again. And this is basically what we're talking about, right? This is coming from the research side. There are so many applications. I was talking a little bit about logistics. So there is a, still a barrier between palletizing and inspection. So bring, bridging or tearing down that barrier is one of the fundamental things we want to, to do over the next years. And now we come to the digital era of robotics, right? So the next step that is being pursued at the moment is to bring robotics into the cloud and really make these systems capable of what we see in all our pockets, right? We have our smartphones in our pockets and we can connect to the world instantaneously. We can download knowledge, we can share knowledge, we can basically get solutions instantaneously and this is where robotics is taking us at the moment. And one of the fundamental things we have to understand in robotics is that this is not just an integration thing anymore, right? So we really try to build things together, we didn't have solutions, we just had components, and we need to come towards a kind of understanding that the robot is just a service. A computer vision is just a service. Everything becomes a service and they can connect with each other, they can talk with each other. So the Internet of Things being extended by the capability of interaction with the world. So all these things that we see in our everyday life is now coming into robotics, everything becoming a service and more and more robots, bodies being there, right? So we have these systems in the real world, capable of interaction, becoming less and less expensive, right? So they become more and more commodity technology. However, on the software side, there is still so much to be done, right? So giving solutions to the customer, giving solutions to the, to the user, really making them human-centered. How can I make a robot as intuitive as an iPhone, right? Everybody has to be able to use a robot and make use of these huge capabilities we get nowadays. And this is essentially what I'm talking about. Going towards a robotics cloud that enables all kinds of applications, going over all domains. So what I'm talking about is a new era of technology, not only of robotics. This will change mankind, right? So we talk about things that will transform within the next 10 years everything we know, everything, how we live, how we interact, how we communicate. Right? So this is where we are at the moment. Robotics has promised this for many, many decades, and now we are finally there, bridging the gap between ideal and reality. And where this will go is really that we can have solutions in the real world from process experts that basically give robots skills, right? transform the knowledge from humans to robots, making them available via robotic app stores to the world. Everybody can share these things. And then really making them so intuitive and usable that the programming interfaces can be used by anyone, right? You just take a robot out of the box, you put it on the table, and then you get it operational within a few minutes. This is 
where we are currently going in robotics, right? So, and sharing the knowledge also between the domain expert that essentially takes the robot, makes use of it. So, for example, a worker, or you're at home, the small and medium enterprises, the big 3C manufacturers, everybody can now make use of this kind of automation technology. And this is the tremendous road, this is the journey that we're taking on at the moment. And finally, what I want to make attention or bring your attention to is that if you kind of got an idea of the story that I'm telling here, taking you to robotics, to a new robotics era that we are currently entering, then I really invite you to Hannover Messe in 2016. We will unveil a revolutionary technology that will transform manufacturing, robotics, and possibly mankind. Please visit franka.de. We will unveil Franka which is a technology that will really change everything you know about, about robotics, about technology, about the way we live, and about the way how we work. You can visit us at www.franka.de. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sami. Are there questions in the audience? It's like... It's it's a pretty shy audience this morning. I can see. Or maybe you have a question to the audience. Yeah, who would like to have a robot at home? They're not so shy, you see. Yeah, you see. Who thinks that we are transforming? Who thinks that technology is really at the edge? Okay, so all the rest, you have to come to Hannover f uh, Fair in, a in four weeks, right? And really see how things change at the moment. Why do robots not look like robots most of the time? Why do robots not look like robots? Well, we saw Pepper. And then yeah. what we see with you looks like, not like the way I imagine robots to look like. Right. I mean, what's, it, it's obviously there is a gap between what we understand what robots are and right. how they're actually used and what they actually are. Yeah. So I think there, that, that's actually a very good question because we obviously have um, kind of the, the our antitype is the human, right? So we essentially try to understand the human by robotics and also use robotics to understand humans, right? So the best template we know about is the human and therefore we try to understand to a certain extent what makes humans so capable, so unique and uh, why is he so successful? Why is he such a, an outstanding creation of, of evolution? And um, can we transform certain things from the human into technical solutions because in the end, if you can do that, that's the perfect match between human and robot, right? Because it's easier to, to understand robots that are closer to humans. What, like for the next five years, what is it that we're going to hate about robots most? Like not maybe today because we seem not to be interacting enough with right. them, but as soon as we start interacting more with them, what's, what's the point about, I mean, we do hate new technology most of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I guess, and I can tell this from personal experience, I hate it if they don't work, right? So that's, I think, the, the most annoying thing about new technology, that you have to get accommodated, you've got to learn how to use it, right? And at the same time, the technology has to learn how you want to use it. And this is, I think, the process we are currently in. So we need to get a much better understanding in how to make robots human-centered, right? And um, this is essentially what, what all my research is also about. How can I make robots that are perfectly designed for humans, right? That the barrier between man and technology is as low as possible, right? So this is, I think, one of the, the biggest challenges we have. But I'm uh, quite positive about that. So the, the difference between a machine and a robot is you actually have to have a university degree, degree to use a machine, but with a robot, it's going to be the other way around. Exactly. The robot is going to have a degree in human-centered uh, centeredness. That's a very nice way of phrasing that, right? I mean, if you look at, at kind of these devices, right? So what, what, I mean, they are extremely capable, right? So we can do so many things with, with these uh, devices. And I don't want to name names, right? Because obviously there are so many different users. Um, but what really was the, the, cre the key was to put the human in the center of the design. So everything to create around the human, and obviously it's not only the robot that understands the human, but the designer of the robot. And I'm not only talking about technologists, right? I'm talking about designers, I'm talking about social interaction people, I'm really talking about the user itself <coughs> giving 
the feedback to the design of the system so that we can really make it as intuitive and as easily accessible as possible. So my personal goal and the goal of my team um, is really to make robots accessible to anyone within minutes, right? So really want to make it possible that I give you a robot, you put it out of the box and you can use it. You understand how to make it. Right? What am I going to use robots for at home? At home, well, there are so many things that we could use robots for, right? I mean, um, do, well, I do have a dishwasher, so I don't need yeah. a robot to do my dishes. Exactly. So I think there is a kind of ro um, roadmap over the next years that we're going to see. So first of all, as typically, industry is currently being transformed, right? So we have human-robot collaboration in industry. Uh, we have new. Um, Markets to be opened up, na naming, for example, the 3C market, right? So huge work is still being done in really horrible situations in lab and manual labor. Um, so this is how we get the scales up in robotics, so that we can also get to the, let's say, price point, that we can use it, you and me, right, in our personal life. And um, as soon as this happens, which, will, or which is already on the way, um, I think the next thing is really we have to, at the same time, really understand how can robotics help people who really need help. Right, um, and you, you saw the one of the videos that I that I showed with um, the the lady basically using the robot as her arm. Right, from a researcher's point of view and an idealist, this is also where I'm, I really want to go. I want to bring down technology to everybody and make it accessible to everybody and especially the people who need it. Right, and I think. Um, in, in there are so many applications in people in need, also prosthetics, right? Making use of robotic technology for prosthetic devices that really make it possible to, again, play piano, right? This is where the things need to go. And for this, we need to make technology accessible to everybody, cost-effective, but also as, as easy to use as possible, right? And, and I think there's a huge agenda, but um, I cannot even count the, the, the numbers of applications I can see. One other thing is, I mean, I'm personally, I'm uh, actually coming from Hanover. I've, I, I grew up in, in the area, but uh, my origins are very different, right? So I think my name already suggests it. So I always had a very distributed family, right? I would love to, I mean, now it, for some things it's, it's too late, but I would have actually loved to interact much better with my relatives overseas, all over the world, right? They are distributed everywhere. And just think about, you can be somewhere without being there, right? And not just via Skype, but you could actually shake hands, you could hug people. I mean, there's so much things. Pepper can do the fist bump. For example, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. But I want to be telling Pepper to, to give the fist bump, right? So there, there are so many things. And what, what I'm also trying to say is, if we can make it accessible to everybody, then everybody can think about applications, right? I mean, let's not always be the experts who tell people what to do. I don't believe in that. I believe in giving technology to people and telling, essentially, what, what is their ideas, what is their potentials, what is their business case in the end, right? So there is so much more behind that. And, and I think it would be almost, uh, let's say, a crime not to let people use the technology and tell us what to do with it, right? Thank you very much. That was a very wonderful talk, Sami. Thank you Give so much. Give a warm hand to Sami. Thanks.